Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us to discuss uh, ethical and practical considerations of data sharing and for protected and at-risk data. Uh, so I'm Caitlin Backer, and I'm joined by my colleague, Katie Wilson. And Katie and I are speaking on behalf of our colleagues at the University of Minnesota Libraries, Shanda Hunt and Shannon Farrell, as well as Alicia hofflick moore of the University of Minnesota Liberal Arts and Technologies and Innovation Services. Now, data sharing is becoming an increasingly prevalent and expected part of the research process. Funding agencies, institutions, and journals are requiring um, that data underlying research reports and publications be made openly available. Uh, and data sharing can encourage greater transparency as well as enable reproducibility of results uh, and just generally informing the larger scientific community. And in fact, the last step in the scientific method is to reproduce the experiment to verify the results. Um, but this last step is rarely, if ever, actually implemented and data sharing can assist um, with enabling that. Now, while data sharing is long established and common in some disciplines, such as astronomy, uh, it's very new in other disciplines, such as public health. And for disciplines in which data sharing is a newer initiative, uh, many researchers view the practice with skepticism or concern, uh, and often for good reason. Researchers may be hesitant to share data sets about human subjects and some plant and animal species that are considered protected data. And additionally, there could be company sites or other uh, public entities um, or private entities uh, that could be put at risk if certain research data about them were shared publicly. So in this presentation, we're gonna walk through a couple of common um, problems that are encountered when sharing human subjects and at-risk data. Uh, and it's not intended to be comprehensive, but rather to highlight some common challenges and some practical strategies to address those challenges. Uh, so our first scenario uh, focuses on human subjects data, because sometimes the ability to broadly share data is actually significantly limited by the choices made before research even begins. And with human subjects data, that's often found in overly restrictive language and informed consent documents uh, and materials submitted to IRBs. So here we have an example of some language from a consent form. Uh, and this is a project that had been approved by the IRB already. Uh, and one major challenge that we can see in this language is the promise that uh, the data will only be shared in aggregate. So that precludes the possibility of making individual level survey responses more broadly available. So if that were the researcher's desire, uh, they would actually need to uh, revise that informed consent document and because it had already been through IRB, they would need to submit those changes to IRB for approval. Now, in the case of a completed project where the data has already been collected, uh, again, we can see in this example of language from a consent form, uh, this language is too restrictive uh, because we have this blanket confidentiality statement uh, and reference to records um, and reports rather than to data. And the only reference to data is that it will be encrypted. So if the researcher were wanting to share more broadly, uh, they would actually need to re-consent to the participants using this less restrictive language that would allow for broader sharing. Now, obviously, uh, re-consenting participants, revising uh, informed consent documents, resubmitting to IRB, uh, these are all time-consuming and potentially stressful experiences, uh, and they may not be feasible in a particular project. Uh, and so the best strategy to deal with them is to avoid them. Uh, and so we want to offer some examples of less restrictive language uh, that curators or other individuals who are supporting researchers could recommend that individuals use for this documentation. So for example, rather than um, promising to eventually destroy the data, uh, instead uh, the researchers could commit to destroying direct identifiers, linking information, and data like identifying audio files. Instead of promising that responses would only be seen by the research team, uh, they could instead state that identifiable information would be kept confidential to the team and then de-identifiable information could be more broadly shared. And then finally, um, rather than committing to sharing or to uh, sharing only in aggregate, they could instead uh, just reassure the participants that appropriate steps would be taken to ensure that their individual privacy um, would not be compromised in that sharing. 
Now, our second scenario involves researchers conducting secondary data analysis. Uh, so perhaps researchers who have received access to a data set from a healthcare system or a similar agency to conduct further analysis. And those researchers then may want to share their analysis um, and the data, uh, and there can be challenges associated with that. Um, one of which is that that data may contain identifiable information. Uh, now, certainly identifiable information is not exclusive to secondary data analysis, but it can be an important point. Um, for example, researchers studying a particular condition or a procedure might have acquired data from a healthcare system that includes information on every person with that condition or who has received that procedure. And if it's a rare condition, that could be a relatively small set. Uh, now, the researchers are unlikely to have access to things like names and social security numbers and so forth, and even if they did, they would likely know to restrict access to that sort of information. But they may not think to restrict access to indirect identifiers, um, which could be information like, say, number of children, country of birth, occupation, other information that is not necessarily protected or unique to the individual, but when combined or used within a context, uh, in this case of a rare condition, could be used to re-identify the person. Now we're not going to get into the details of all of the ways to de-identify data because that is a very complicated topic um, and how one would approach de-identification and what would be sufficient will vary from project to project. But despite those complexities we did want to share some strategies for data de-identification for curators. Um, so first, one straightforward strategy would be to remove the risky variables, um, particularly if they add little value to the data overall. Or categories could be collapsed. So instead of reporting an age range of, say, five years, for example, one could report an age range of 10 years. If releasing an entire data set would lead to a re-identification risk, um, one could instead release a subset of that data as a more appropriate strategy. Or if the re-identification risk were quite high, the data might instead be released through restricted access methods, such as being governed by data use agreements. And data use agreements can and often do govern secondary data analysis. So researchers who receive data from other sources often need to agree to specific terms and conditions. And these can also be a useful mechanism for researchers who are wanting to make their data available, but need to do so under specific conditions. Uh, a data use agreement is a written contract that commonly outlines elements such as the ways in which the data can be used and by whom and how it will be protected. Um, so for example, the researchers accessing the data may have to agree to specifics about secure data storage, who it is that can access raw data, and potentially how and when researchers would need to delete and dispose of that data. And it usually covers information around uh, data ownership, intellectual property, and subsequent sharing as well. So for researchers who work, whose work is governed by these agreements, uh, it's really important to be aware of what's actually in the agreements. But this can also be a really useful tool for researchers who want to facilitate access and sharing and for whom other mechanisms may not be appropriate. Hi, this is Katie, and I'll be taking over to talk about genomics data, our third scenario. So genomics data are important um, and kind of a growing interest in the fields for medical research, animal and plants and sciences. Um, but I'm specifically going to be talking about uh, medical research today and kind of building off what we've already talked about in the first two case studies. And probably one of the biggest um, issues with genomics data is the risk of re-identification, specifically where genomic research data is combined with results from recreational genealogical databases and public information to not only identify um, participating, partic uh, participating individuals in research studies, but also their relatives. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk about two studies really briefly, um, both of which took place in 2013. Um, the first from Jimarek et al., in, um, where they took Y chromosomes from 10 males from a research study, entered their specific and unique Y chromosomes um, information into a public Y chromosome database, um, which then retrieved uh, their surnames, surname spelling verifications, and zip codes of folks that had um, voluntarily submitted that information online. Um, and then they combined what they had found so far from the study as well as what they found from this um, public database um, with obituaries, geological websites, um, and metadata from the Human Genetic Cell Repository at the Coriel Institute and identified a further 50 people that were relatives to that um, initial sample of 10. And then Sweeney, um, in 2013, and her team identified um, kind of 
did a similar project, but on a much larger scale, where they scraped the personal genome project database um, and compared what they found, which included postal code information, gender, and date of birth, um, and compared it with public voter rules. And by that, they were able to ID 84 to 97% of um, identif uh, participants positively numbering in the thousands. And there are several regulations that help protect genomic information. Um, HIPAA, we've already kind of talked about. I just wanted to tack on that in 2013, of course, when these two studies took place, um, there was an amendment created um, to clearly define that genetic information is protected health information, um, as well as to provide further guidance for consent forms um, and encouraging researchers to include in their consent forms that there is a possibility of re-identification. There's also GINA, um, which is more for health insurers, um, making it against the law for insurers to request, require, or um, use genetic information to make decisions about eligibility for health insurance, um, premiums, contribution amounts, and coverage terms. Um, and if anyone's wondering, voluntary wellness program employees can't be penalized for not sharing, but they do leave money on the table, so that is not necessarily protected. There's GDPR, which I'm not going to say I'm an expert in. I'm still learning about it myself. Um, but it also puts more emphasis on the accountability of data controllers, which includes individuals, organizations, public agencies, um, to be responsible for data security and privacy. However, it does allow for some flexibility with scientific research, specifically requirements for um, consent language, data storage, and retention, and does allow EU members to um, allow uh, to introduce further provisions for genetic and health data. So there are two strategies um, we talked about uh, for addressing re-identification. The first, which we've kind of already talked about, is restricted or controlled access um, for researchers. That means depositing in repositories that can allow for tiered access. Um, a greater emphasis on reviewing secondary users of data at time of data requests. Um, that can also include DUAs and withholding identifiable data unless explicitly requested. Um, there's also the strategy of being very explicit in your consent form language about the possibility of re-identification at the time of consent, going beyond where it's going to be stored, and sharing how it might be represented and shared explicitly and within in language that people can understand. Furthermore, suggestions for curators, um, thinking about working with your researchers, think about how data can be reused. Is every data point necessary for research and their project? Um, encouraging people to think about how can this um, project be used to harm participants and in genomics case, their relatives. Um, restricting access for secondary users, and this means being comfortable with um, uh, routing people to uh, repositories that are not your own that may provide um, different security uh, levels and services that you can't provide, and reviewing consent forms. Our last case study is endangered species, um, species that are given different statuses based on the risk of their extinction. Um, and there are a few laws and agreements that protect endangered species data. The first is the Endangered Species Act, which the purpose is to protect and recover um, species and the ecosystems upon which they depend, um, in, at least in the United States. And internationally, there's CITES, the Convention on International Trade in, in, Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora, Fauna and Flora. And thinking further about how sharing research data impacts these species. So um, our quite sad um, case study here um, is about poaching. In 2015, and at Nairs Latka uh, Nature Reserve in South Africa, a ranger approached and discovered a couple with a backpack full of succulents, endangered succulents. And upon following up um, and investigating their um, guest house or hotel room, they found that they had over $80,000 worth of poached succulents. And this is not necessarily an isolated incident um, where shared or published location data for endangered species has um, driven poaching or local extinction in some cases, such as the Chinese cave gecko. So when can you share and when should you share biodiversity data? Um, it's not clear cut. Uh, this 2018 article that's at the bottom of this slide here um, does a great job of weighing the pros and cons of sharing um, location data as well as a great decision tree. 
this is the decision tree. <laughs> um, as you can see, it provides outcome, outcomes such as like make the data public or restrict access or some more severe guiding um, language about masking identifications, locations, map, or GIS data. So suggestions for curators include help your researchers mask uh, specific locations, destroy ident direct identifiers, linking information, restricting access for species at risk, and look for other data sources, kind of similar to the genomics case study. Whoops. Um, be aware of how other public existing data can be combined with research data in order to uncover um, locations of endangered species. So in conclusion, um, there are several skills in which researchers and curators and people working with da uh, research data can improve upon. Um, sharing protected and at-risk data requires careful consideration of any and all agreements, contracts, and consent forms, and assessing identification issues and appropriate levels of access in repositories. Someone else in an earlier presentation mentioned the data curation network primers. Um, again, these curations are living documents that anyone can access via GitHub or the data creation site um, that helps people make decisions about how to curate or manage um, data with spe specific subjects or disciplinary, disciplinary areas. I cannot say that word. And looking to the future, institutional policies can make a real difference with wrangling um, at-risk data. Researchers can be resistant to changing these practices. Institutional research oversight groups can provide training and implement policies to encourage or require data sharing. Um, and from at the U of M, um, we continue to request meetings with the Human Rights Protection Program under OVPR to discuss sharing and educational opportunities with data sharing. And eventually this led to us being put on the educational advisory group that works with the IRB, which then also led to um, we've been invited to weigh in on um, protected health information policies and greater data sharing policies at the U. Uh, this is our contact information once again. Um, yeah, thank you.